warm, warm welcome to all of you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a special welcome to any of you who may be viewing for the first time our program, The Voice of Truth. And most of you by this time have gotten accustomed to this face. I'm Paul Fry. Delighted to spend these few minutes with you in a study of the precious Word of God. I'd like to ask you a question. If the Lord were to evaluate your prayer life, <clears throat> how would you write down? Would he say that it's listless, lifeless, dutiful, without heart? Or would he say that the only time I hear prayers from this one is when they're in trouble? Or is it a fervent prayer with ardor, with passion, one who knows the God who he is praying to? Whatever the case may be with you or with me, there is much that we can learn from our study today from a man by the name of Jabez. This <clears throat> man is listed in only two verses from the book of Chronicles. It's in chapter 4. And before I read these two verses, beginning at the first chapter of Chronicles, we have a registrar of all the names that the Holy Spirit wanted us uh, to know that descended from Adam and then in the line of Abraham. And as someone has said, they are like stones, row upon row of stones without life. And then we come to chapter 4 of First Chronicles, Two verses that, as someone said, it's like a fragrant shrub, an oasis, like a palm tree bearing fruit. Two verses that refresh the soul in the midst of all these names that someone has recorded are like stones and rows. Let me read from these two verses in First Chronicles chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. And his mother called his name uh, Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. Now, before I read the second verse, I'd like to mention that this name that was given to him is also the name of a village in chapter 2, verse 55 in Judah. It could have been, and the name means to grieve, sorrowful. And it could have been that Jabez's mother had great sorrow when she bore him in childbirth. Now this is also recorded in Genesis 3.16 that that would be the lot of women as they bear their children. There would be sorrow, but that would be quickly erased because a child has been born. Or it could have meant that maybe Jabez's father was taken by the Lord during his mother's pregnancy. Whatever the case might be, he began his entrance into the world in the word that reflects his name, sorrowful, sorrowful. But he didn't remain a sorrowful person because the Bible says here he was more honorable than his brethren. And then verse 10, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Here was a prayer that God answered, and it's the title of our message today. Prayer that God answers. I would confess to you that some of my prayers, and I'm sure many of yours, have not ascended above the ceiling in the room in which we prayed. And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says, he that regards iniquity in his heart, the Lord will not hear that prayer. Again, in Proverbs 28, 9, it says, that he that turneth his ear from hearing the law, in other words, making light of God's word, even his prayer shall be an abomination to the Lord. Even the children of Israel in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 15 it says your many prayers I will not hear why because they were in rebellion 
against God. They, the covenant people, and that's why it's called the God, why Jabez called him the God of Israel. There was a covenant relationship between God and the children of Abraham. We know that <laughs> is uh, borne out um, in um, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. It says, Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Again, David prayed like this. He said, when he addressed the Lord, he said, O Lord God of Israel, thou art our Father forever and forever. <clears throat> Thine is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty. All that is in heaven and all that in, is in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom and thou art head over all. And again, uh, but how could David and how could Isaiah the prophet speak so confidently about God being the God of Israel? What did they do to deserve that covenant relationship out of all the peoples of the earth? Well, when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 9 and uh, uh, verse 4 to 6, we find our Lord speaking to the children of Israel. Israel I did not drive out the nations before you because you were more righteous than they. No, I drove them out for mine own purpose, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Now notice, that covenant relationship was not based upon their righteousness. Neither was it based upon the fact that they were so many. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says these words, I did not choose you because you were more than all the people, but he said, because I loved you. And then again in Deuteronomy chapter 4, um, Moses the prophet again is speaking that no nation were so blessed to have such righteous laws and statutes as the children of Israel. This is the God of Israel that Jabez was praying to, that made him, his character doesn't say anything about his youth, but at an early age, he must have come to trust the God of Abraham, the Redeemer of Israel that we just uh, saw in Isaiah chapter 41. And who is the Redeemer of Israel? The great I Am the one that uh, spoke with Moses there at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And then again in John chapter 8, verse 59, we see this one revealed in the days of his humanity when he was incarnated, Emmanuel, God with us, and he said before Abraham was, he used that same title, I am. So you see, the first word I'd like you to think about as we think about prayer that God answers is conviction about who God is. You see, in dealing with Israel, it was all sovereign grace. There was nothing about Abraham or his seed that merited the, the favor of God. But by God's sovereign grace, he chose Abraham and the descendants that followed. So when we come to God, we must recognize his sovereign grace that enables a sinner to come and have audience with him. And how, what way could the children of Israel have audience with the creator of the heavens and the earth, the lawgiver and the judge? And as judge, he would have to condemn every one of the children of Israel because they were sinners like all who had descended from Abraham. But you see, God revealed through the worship that he ordained for the children of Israel, the blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement for the soul. And all those sacrifices would point to the Lamb of God that would come to take away the sin of the world, the supreme atoning sacrifice that would not take away sin just or cover sin for a year, as was the Old Testament worship as the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year. But forever for those whom receive and are the objects of his sovereign grace as in the new testament the new testament church no man can come unto me unless the father draw him to me and all that come to me 
I will not cast away. Salvation is all the sovereign grace of God. As the word of God goes out, certainly through the Old Testament prophets, they all spoke of the coming Redeemer. And that's how they could have an audience with God because they believed in the coming Redeemer who would take away their sin as recorded in Romans chapter 3 and verses 25 and 26. And then in the New Testament, we look back to the cross. The Old Testament saints, they looked forward to the cross believing that's where their sin would be dealt with. Now the New Testament church looks back to the cross. Those who come to faith in Jesus Christ looks back to the cross for that's where sin was dealt with. That's where the lawlessness and guilt and shame of all our sinful behavior was dealt with of those that Jesus came to save. And so we see there must be a conviction as we come to the Lord God of heaven and earth, whether it was in the Old Testament church or here in the New Testament days. It has to be recognized that the mighty God, the Creator, the lawgiver and the judge must condemn sin because he is holy. But in his love and mercy and grace, he sent the Redeemer, the one whom Isaiah talked about, the Lord of heaven and earth, Jesus. The Old Testament name for him would be Yeshua, Yahweh. But here in the New Testament is Jesus. He came to save his people from their sins. And that's how we have an audience with the God of heaven and earth through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his shed blood, through his atoning sacrifice. And all those have access to the throne of grace who have come and laid down the weapons of their warfare, who acknowledge the righteous demands of the law and humble themselves there at the cross, crying out for mercy in faith, believing that this one called Jesus paid the debt for sin, his sin, your sin, my sin. And there is a holy, there is a surrender to his holy rule. That's how we have access to the Lord Jesus Christ. Those whom are drawn to the Savior and in faith and in surrender come to him and go through the straight gate and the narrow way that leads to life. They always have an access to the Father, just like Jabez did. So and one more time, I want to emphasize, if we're going to have our prayers ascend above the ceiling, we have to have conviction about whom we are talking to. So many times I hear politicians or celebrities, when there is some kind of a calamity or tragedy, they say, pray, pray. How in the world is the Lord going to hear the prayers of those who are in rebellion against him? The Bible says, let me repeat that verse. He that turned away my, their ear from hearing the law, even their prayer is an abomination. And I thought of all these that ask for prayer and how they <clears throat> brazenly defy God's word. I would just encourage you that this has been always the New Testament approach that the Apostle Paul said, for this cause I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, is through Jesus Christ that we have access to God who is holy. There must be conviction about who he is. And secondly, there must be a commitment to him. Notice these words in verse 9, uh, verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, as I spoke about conviction, about who God is, the one whom we talk to when we go in prayer. Secondly, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me. And here we speak of commitment to this God that we're praying to. Do you think that we can come to God in prayer, and then govern our own life and live the way we want to, the only way that we can certainly have God to answer our prayer is when we come acknowledging his right to govern our life, committed to him. When he said to bless me, he means to be under thy divine favor. In other words, his life was God-centered. 
He wanted to live under the presence of God and to know the favor of God and the blessing of God upon his life. Just like Jacob of old when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord there in Genesis 32, 26. He wrestled all night and uh, the angel of the Lord said, let me go. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So much did Jacob want to live under the favor of God. And then <clears throat> we also find that it says, in verse 10 it says, and enlarge my coast. What he's really saying is that he wanted his sphere of influence to uh, increase. In other words, he wanted his life to touch other lives for the God in whom he had learned to love and know and trust. You see, that's what happens when we want the Lord to bless us, when we want to live under his favor. And when we want to expand our coast, we want to increase our horizon of influence. In other words, I can put it to someone that said, we want to make more room in our heart for the pleasure for the Lord in the pleasures that we engage in. We want to make more room in our heart for the duties that we engage in around the home, at work, whatever it is. We want him to be a part of everything that we do. We want him <clears throat> to be more of a part of every uh, activity in our home that he feels welcome, whatever room of the house we're in. To enlarge our coast means to enlarge our heart, to make more room for him in every area of our life. And again, <clears throat> not only in our home, but also in our possessions. We have to remember that if we're going to pray to the God of heaven as our God, our Father, we have to recognize that he is owner of all, just like David understood that. He said, all that is in heaven and earth is thine. We have to understand that, to make room for him, make room in our heart for him concerning our possessions and how we use them. And then for our goals and ministry. And then notice in <coughs> uh, the last part of that verse says in Psalm, in, in verse 10 it says, and that, that thy hand might be with me. What it's speaking about is utter dependence upon God for knowing what Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. And that is so absolutely true. Things that will count for the kingdom of God, without me you can do nothing. See, this is what was Jabez's heart. He had a heart for God, he had a conviction about God, and he had a commitment to God to count for the kingdom of God that David spoke about when he said, that Thine is the kingdom. And again, <clears throat> we find that uh, not only um, um, the sphere of influence maybe could be summed up in these words by our Lord in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'll take care of the rest. He doesn't say it in those words, but that's my paraphrase. And he, he says, all these things that you worry about will be added to you. So he knew the utter dependence. He knew that there was no one that could help him except the Lord, like uh, in the last days of our Lord's uh, earthly uh, ministry. They were beginning to turn away. They flocked after him when he was doing many miracles, but then he began to say some hard things that they couldn't handle many of the multitude, and many turned away from him. And Jesus said to his disciples, he said, will you too turn away from me? And then Peter said words that we ought to remember. Of whom shall we turn to? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Who are we going to turn to? Oh, we can turn to all those voices uh, in the media, regardless how, uh, that parrot out the standards and the fashions and the glitter of this world. Oh, yeah, we can listen, but can they help us? When we're in need, not one bit. And then, hurriedly, I'd like to uh, talk about not only conviction about who we're praying to, not only commitment to the God that we're praying to. Our life belongs to Him. We're here to serve Him. We're here to count for His kingdom, not the kingdom of men. And thirdly, consecration. Listen to these words here in verse 10. That thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. I call this consecration. He had an abhorrence of evil. You see, evil, when it's embraced, is like a tyrant. It keeps you in its hold. It's merciless until the, <clears throat> the uh, wages of sin are enacted, and then it mocks when you're in trouble. That is a good description of evil, and yet, 
Men play with that like a powder puff instead of treating it like a rattlesnake like they should. For what the rattlesnake is to the human body, so sin is to the soul. And so if we're going to have an audience with a king, with a God of heaven and earth, then we have to have an abhorrence of evil. There has to be consecration. There has to be a recognizing that if I say I love him, then I must hate evil. Psalm 97, 10. We have to recognize that if we can say God is our Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have to recognize that we're set apart for him. Like David said, he said, <clears throat> but know this, that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. You see, when we have come to know the holiness of God, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, given His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell within, then our likes, the desire of our heart, should be in harmony with the heart of God. And what is the central attribute of God the Creator? It's His holiness. Sin has separated, but in Jesus Christ that barrier has been removed, and there is redemption, there is forgiveness in Him. To those who come, and I never weary saying this, change direction in life and come to Him in repentance and faith. And again, the proof of our love is to hate what God hates, to love what God loves, and to be separate from this world that makes a mockery of sin, which is lawlessness against Him, God the Creator. I would like to share something with you that really describes what I'm trying to say to you. Many times God would use common events of uh, the, the life of, uh, of men or something from nature. And this is an illustration from nature. It's not recorded in the scripture, but it certainly drives home the point I want to make. The little white ermine is a fur-bearing animal that is very proud of his precious white coat. And so those who have an ermine the fur coat, they're quite expensive. And so what the hunters would do when they would go out with the dogs to get this little fur-bearing animal, they would um, smear filth around the uh, home, the den of this little fur-bearing animal because they knew the character of the little white ermine. He would uh, rather die than be defiled by filth. And so he would, when the chase would begin, he would go to his home and there it would be all covered with filth. So he would turn around and face the dogs, for he would rather be coated with his own blood than to be defiled by filth. Now let's apply that to consecration we would rather suffer the consequences of standing alone against the standards of this world, its fashions, and its rebellion against God than to be filed by sin that entices us everywhere we turn. In <coughs> conclusion, Jabez's prayer was heard as we just recorded, as we just read several times because he had conviction about the God whom he was praying to. And he came with a heart that was committed to God regarding the kingdom of God. And thirdly, he was consecrated to God, set apart for God, separate from the world. The world hates the Lord Jesus Christ, but he separated himself from that because he had a, the spirit of Christ. He loves the things of Christ and he despised the things that are holy. Listen to these words from Psalm 119. Horror hath taken hold upon me, David said, because they have forsaken thy law. And again he said, I have esteemed all thy statutes to be right. Notice what else he says. Therefore I hate every false way. And again in Psalm 119, 136, rivers of water run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. If ever we have lived in a state of lawlessness, it is today. Oh, how well I can remember last Thursday when I went and <clears throat> got off at the uh, 42nd and Broadway subway and I'm walking on the streets 
and what did I run across but seven or eight beautiful ladies wearing a clear plastic raincoat garb and a g-string I I saw they were handing out some kind of merchandise but when I saw that I just was sickened to the pit of my soul for I saw how shameless this society has become and I said to one of the officers standing there I said it won't be long until everything is removed that's how far we have sunk in our depravity our sin and depravity but dear ones in television land I want to encourage you there's this is still the day of grace it's a grace for those who will flee to the Savior for refuge for he the Savior is the God of Israel and he is the Redeemer of all who have sinned and we all have sinned and come short of his glory and if you have never come to the Lord Jesus Christ laying down the weapons of your warfare acknowledging the righteous demands of the law seeing yourself a criminal in God's court of heaven knowing that you need his mercy and his forgiveness come to him today he will not turn any aside who come in truth one word you see our address on the bottom of your screen you see our telephone number we have a lot of good gospel literature that we'd like to give to you uh, we have these messages are now available in VCR tapes all without charge to you for in our older years ha our soul having been set free by the truth we like to share the truth who will ever ask for it without charge so you call or you write and we'll be glad to grant your request again could I just one last word remember the next time you go to prayer have conviction about who you're talking to and ask yourself is my heart really committed to the work of his kingdom and then thirdly is my life set apart as holy unto God set apart from the awful standards and filth and depravity of this world oh my dear ones just with Jabez the Lord is not any um, he's not partial and you come to him like Jabez he will answer your prayer God bless you until we meet again Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, more thee all the follies of sin I resign, my I say